Okay, we are continuing with What is Saving Faith by Gordon Clark and discussing subjective believing, the mental act of faith. And the mental act of faith, we shouldn't think of simply as soil. It's not simply soil, but it's the sown word in the soil. There's no such thing as thought without content. And so last time we had discussed under understanding, understanding the declarative statements with objectively defined terms and logic in a logically consistent system. So now in this video, we will discuss assent, the mental act of the will accepting an, an understood statement as true, as you're becoming persuaded. Uh, and we're going to discuss Mark, start off with the scripture reading from Mark, chapter 4, verse 20. And it says, others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. And so we can see that uh, what they are hearing is the word. And we had discussed in the second video that the word never refers to just a single word. What we're talking about is a declarative statement, a statement that asserts truth or a system of declarative statements. We discussed in this objective beliefs. And uh, it's important to pay attention to here. This is like seed sown on good soil. And so we're not talking about, that, that's a metaphor. We're not talking about, you know, invisible seeds that a pastor is shooting out of his fingertips, you know, shooting faith out of his fingertips and uh, magical seeds are going into, invisible seeds are going into our head. No, that's a metaphor. And what we are talking about is understanding statements asserting truth. That's the literal. So this is, a, this is the metaphor. What does that metaphor mean? It means hearing the word, the declarative statements, accepting that, accepting them with our will. This is, this is a matter of the volition of your accepting. So, uh, so we can see from this scripture that belief is not, subjective believing is not merely understanding, but it also means that we accept the message or the word the declarative statement is true. It, you know, it can be a promise about a declarative statement about the future, which would be a promise. It can be a declarative statement about the past, about the good news, uh, the message of the gospel. It can be a declarative statement about a proverb, or something uh, abstracted from time. Uh, so, it's, but it is going to be in the form of a declarative statement. Um, so it's not enough that we merely understand the declarative statement. In order to be good soil, we have to accept it. Now I'm going to show a scripture reading from John chapter 8, verse 58, to give an example of the Pharisees who understood the meaning of, a de of Jesus' declarative declaration, but did not accept it as true. And here we have... And John 8, 58 through 59, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him. So here is a declarative statement. This is a declaration that Jesus is making about his identity. And... Uh, The Pharisees understood the necessary implications of this declaration probably better, certainly better, than most of Jesus' followers, legitimate believers, uh, who were largely illiterate and who were mostly non-Jewish, or, or, or many of them non-Jewish. So, uh, to a Jewish person... Of course, someone trained in theology would know that a claim to pre-existence is a claim to divine quality. 
and also that Jesus used the name of God told to Moses on Mount Sinai to identify himself. Let's go ahead and take a look at that scripture just so if people are not familiar with the Old Testament, know that every Jew in, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, every Jew in Israel, was certainly aware of this paramount scripture with, G with Moses on Mount Sinai. And this is Moses' discussion with God. Moses said to God, Suppose the Israelites ask me, what is his name? God said to Moses, This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So that's from Exodus 3, chapter 14, or, or verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. And so this is the name of God, I am, often translated Jehovah. And so Jesus is using I am to identify himself. And so now this is the Lord speaking di direct truth from the mouth of God to these Pharisees. And they clearly understood what he was saying, but that didn't make them accept it as truth. So, in fact, it's because they clearly understood what he was saying was why, was not why they believed it, but was why they sought to kill him. So, uh, you know, we can say this same concept uh, in the reverse. You know, we can talk about Marxism. We can, we can understand Marxism just simply because we understand it doesn't mean we accept it as true. In fact, we can study it diligently with the purpose of refuting it. So just merely understanding a declarative statement or a set of declarative statements, a system of declarative statements, does not mean that you necessarily believe it. But in order to believe, you must understand. So you can't take away understanding as one of the necessary elements of belief. I, they call, I call it faith minus, you know, take, trying to take away one of the essential elements of believing. And this is, as you recall, from an earlier video, we talked about the birds that try to snatch away understanding. And this is just to always be on guard, and we can't say it enough, that to be aware and to be vigilant against these buzzards who are trying to take understanding as one of the necessary elements out of faith. So, uh, and so we're just going to go ahead and draw some of the connections here. Let me grab a pen. And so over here, when we're discussing objective believing, the objective beliefs, uh, what is the connection between the universal system and applying it to us, applying it to me? So I see in the universal system, all men are sinners. Now, I look to myself and to apply it to me, I say, wait a minute, I am a man. Then the very necessary implication is that I am a sinner. And so this is the connection between this and this is a connection between propositions. So this is a relationship between propositions, necessary logical implications drawn between propositions. Um, now, this might be a little bit of a difficult concept to understand, and if you don't understand it, it's not the end of the world, but there's a distinction between logical necessary implications and cause and effect, because cause and effect is in time and space. Whereas when you're talking about relationships between propositions, uh, syllogisms, that's not really in time and space, it's abstracted from time and space. And so when we're going across the board this way, we're talking about cause and effect in time and space, like a cue ball hitting the six ball and it goes in the corner pocket. 
that's cause and effect it should be distinguished from logical implications. Those are, those are two different, uh, you know, you, there is a, there, in both of them, there is a logical order from one to the next, uh, but, but they are of a different type of order. And so we've got necessary implications going down this way. Now, uh, hearing the objective word is the cause, and the cause and effect is the cause <clears throat> of believing, of the cause of understanding. And so, uh, you know, in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. So, uh, we've got this objective, the objective beliefs and the application to myself must proceed subjectively understanding it. And so this isn't, a, this isn't a cause and effect relationship. Now, what is the relationship between understanding and assent? And this is something that evades people a little bit. Uh, certainly, uh, it's important to understand that you can't assent to something that you don't first understand. There's no schism between, uh, there's, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, watching out for the buzzers. There's no such thing as assenting to something that you first don't understand. As Gordon Clark says, every volition, every volition of your act of your will, accepting it, is preceded by a prior intellection. And so he uses the word intellection, which means you intellectually understand it. You know, the, Jesus says, my disciples will know the truth. Uh, and so... Objective truth is something that we know. It's, it's knowledge. And so watch out for the buzzards who try to take that away and say, no, it's not knowledge. No, yes, it is knowledge. It's knowledge of God's word. But now, as we talk about the relationship between these two, we can say, yes, understanding necessarily precedes assent. But unlike over here, understanding does not necessarily compel assent. Uh, you know, it's an act of the will. It is not a matter of necessarily compelled implications. So we can see, it, you know, understanding doesn't compel or necessarily persuade people, as we just saw with the Pharisees. Um, so over here we have the cause of faith. The cause is hearing. Uh, and the seeds are promiscuously, promiscuously broadcast. You know, we talked about in the first video that, you know, of course the seeds fell into the ears of the Pharisees. Jesus is standing right in their face, telling him, telling them direct words from God, direct truth from God. So there's no problem with the preacher. <laughs> and there was no problem with the word. These, the, the seed is being scattered. It's, and we, as we discussed in the first video, it landed in the ears of demons. Demons understood, can understand truth. So uh, the soil that the seed land, you know, in the parable of the sower, the, the, you know, the parable says you scatter, that, that the sower sowed the seed. He scatters it. Some of it lands on hard, on, on stony soil, you know, and then some of it does land on fertile good soil. And so, uh, th basically what the point here is, is that throwing the seed on the soil is not what makes the soil fertile. And so we should, so there is not a causal relationship between understanding and assent, that, that there is a, another factor that causes people to assent. And keep in mind, when you assent to a new belief that you didn't believe before, that is a change of mind. And when a person changes their mind about the gospel, know that there is, that is not something that we are capable of doing on our own, that God, the Holy Spirit, must be involved in that process. So keep in mind that although assent must necessarily be preceded by understanding. 
Understanding is not the cause. It's not a causal relationship between these two. And so just, you know, this is the first point, that there's no schism, that assent must be of a declare, an understood declarative statement. It's a prerequisite, but the relationship is not causal. That there is another cause over here, the Holy Spirit and God is causing us to assent. And so, now just one thing to, uh, I, I want, this is a little bit of an aside, that we, when we say assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, that is the act of the will accepting and being persuaded. We are not talking, the word that we're not saying is A-S-C-E-N-T. <clears throat> you know, like to climb a mountain, ascend, ascent, to go up. And um, I, I just, it's just a, a, a confusion that I see a, a lot of times in these discussions. And the problem with it, one of the big problems with it, of course, is that it's just a, the words sound alike and it causes confusion. But also over on the objective side, I think you could legitimately talk about somebody who gets flighty and is ungrounded and who's just understanding the doctrines of the Bible, but not applying it to themselves. Uh, you know, you can say, oh yeah, some people are sinners. Yeah, those sinners out there and not being applying it to myself. And so you could speak of a person like that is, you know, ascending, uh, asc you know, climbing high, being lofty in their thoughts, uh, being detached and, and ungrounded. Uh, but I, let's, I would just use words like that and not use the word ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T, because it just has such a propensity to cause confusion. So um, when we're talking about ascent, we're talking about something that is subjective, not something that's objective. And so that takes us to the second point, that when we are talking about ascent, we are talking about we are not talking about something objective. And this is, this is a funny thing for Christians, because we are, so many of our battles, especially in the last, say, 200 years, has been against fighting subjectivism. You know, especially, you know, taking the, 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 the enemies of the, the church are taking matters of objective truth and trying to make them subjective. So many of the Pelagianism, especially trying to make it subject to man's will. Uh, but in this case, we have to guard against the opposite direction of the error, taking something that is necessarily subjective and trying to make it objective. And there was a, a, a heretic that preached in the 1820s and 30s, a very famous preacher named Charles Finney, who taught exactly that assent was objective. Um, and so he taught a subversive definition of the of assent and he put it in the objectively in the wrong column and he was a lawyer um darn lawyers and uh he supplanted the biblical definition with a common law the common law definition what is the common law the common law is just that those set of precedences that have been handed down from england and it's how men judge assent in the formation of contracts and conveyances. Um, so now there's two main problems with that. We're going to discuss the first main problem with that in this video. We're going to discuss a, a, another main problem with that in the next video. Uh, but the way the common law would define assent, I'll give you a, a, a probably a, a very typical law school exam question. Suppose we have a uh, we have a farmer, and he has a truckload of, of radishes, and he wants to sell his radishes for fifty dollars. He goes to a uh, a restaurant owner in town, and he goes up to the restaurant owner and says, "Hey, I'll sell you these radishes for fifty dollars." Now the restaurant owner doesn't want the radishes, and he doesn't want to contract with this farmer but he wants to let the farmer know that he respects him. He wants to let the farmer know that he, he can see he's got dirt all over his overalls, he's been working hard, he wants to tell him he respects him. So he walks up to him and he shakes his hand and nods his head 
and to let him know that he respects him. Now, in the subjective mind of the restaurant owner, he was not entering into contract. He was not, he was not agreeing. He was not subjectively agreeing to this contract. Um, but to, in the farmer's mind, he thought that the guy was saying, yeah, I want to buy these radishes from you, a handshake. That's, that's how you make a deal. All the onlookers who were around, all in the men's eyes, all around, thought that, they, that the, the restaurant owner was intending to convey, objectively manifest his assent to the contract. And so if he was on a law school exam, the answer to that would be yes, the contract was formed because the farmer or because the restaurant owner had objectively manifested assent regardless of what his subjective state of mind is. So, um, and, and as viewed in all the eyes of men. And Charles Finney would have revivals where he would encourage people in the pews to raise their hand before the congregation to manifest assent to the gospel. Now, um, now Clark, one time he was discussing this issue of objectively manifested assent. And he said, some people think that assent is merely something verbal that we say out loud, but we don't mean. Of course, that is not assent. That is hypocrisy. <laughs> and he always delivers a line like John Wayne. Uh, see, how other men judge is irrelevant. You know, because God can, you know what your thoughts are, and God can read your mind. So, uh, you know what, it, so it's, it's, not an, it's, it's not an issue of what you can prove. This is something that is, it, what the philosophers call, is, is immediate knowledge. You know what's in your own mind. You don't have to prove that to other people. And especially when we're talking about issues, uh, I mean, so especially if we're talking about an issue about the future, you know, how could you possibly, there's no way that you could, you can believe something about the future. You can believe that Jesus will come again. You can believe that uh, the world's going to implode in a big bang and not exist anymore. You believe things about the future, but if they have not happened yet, you can't possibly prove that it happened. You know, you can't, you can't prove scientifically and you can't prove in a court of law, especially now, especially when we're talking about issues of things such as life after death. These are not issues that are capable of being proved, but that's not the question that we're asking. We're simply asking, do you subjectively believe them? We're not asking, can you prove it in a court of law? So, assent is subjective, and so therefore, necessarily, it is sincere. As Clark says, assent is always sincere, no matter what the person believes, he believes it sincerely. So, uh, because it is, is subjective, it is ipso facto sincere. And so, of course, when Charles Finney, we have to worry about whether it's sincere or not. Now, this brings us to another question. This brings us to the next question of certainty. So, uh, it being a subjective issue, a lot of people have anxiety over whether they uh, are subjectively certain enough. Uh, they have anxiety about, uh, about whether they believe enough. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, I heard a preacher one time saying, well, when you believe in the gospel, you know that you know that you know. Well, that's great to have that type of assurance, what the Westminster Confession calls assurance. But most Christians don't have this, you know, cosmic level. I, I say no Christian has a cosmic level of certainty. Um, you know, I, I did a, I, I just, in preparation of this video, I just looked on YouTube for the word persuasion. Um, and it seemed like every video said fully persuaded. <laughs> there was no video on just being persuaded. All the videos were on being fully persuaded. Now that's going to discourage, you know, especially baby Christians who don't have absolute certainty 
this cosmic certainty that apparently uh, some preachers say that you must have. And, but that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, so it's not so much the excellency, the excellence of your subjective certainty that saves you. See, that's the important thing. It's not, it's not if you have just 100% confidence. That's not the necessary standard. It's because it's the veracity of the objective truth that saves you. Let me give an example, because I guess that's a little bit, uh, a little bit difficult to understand what I'm saying here. So, uh, if you believed that the ice was thick enough to skate on, and so if you 100%, or you say you 95% believe that the ice was thick enough to skate on, uh, and then there was another person who, who merely 51% believed that the ice was thick enough to skate on. And the ice wasn't thick enough to skate on. It was a lie. You, both of you had believed in a lie. Would there be any difference between the person who had 100% certainty and the person who just had just 51% certainty? <laughs> no, you would both be 100% dead. There's not going to be any, the, the person with 100% confidence isn't going to suspend in midair uh, and defy gravity as you drown because you only had 51% confidence. No, no. The, because it is not, the issue is not your subjective level of confidence that whether you are saved or whether you die. The issue is the objective truth of what you believe, whether it's the truth or whether it's a lie. And so, um, subjective certainty need only be feeble enough to trigger your will. So, if you were lost, uh, another example, say you were lost in the desert. Let me just say this. Would you rather be 51% sure, just barely enough to trigger your will, of the true oasis, or would you rather be 100% sure of the direction of a false mirage? You know, I see it right, I can see it with my own eyes, it's right there, because, you know, you, it's, it's, a, it's an optical illusion, it looks like it's there. Would you rather be 51% certain of the truth, of the true direction, or would you be 100% sure of the false direction. See, so it is not your subjective level of certainty that saves you. It's whether what you say, what you believe is true or not. That's the objective truth is what saves you. And so now you do have to have enough confidence to trigger your will. I'm not saying you don't have to be persuaded. You do have to be persuaded to trigger your will. But even the feeblest uh, acceptance suffices. And so, um, you know, if your objective beliefs are a lie, you know, your subjective confidence can be a very, very bad thing. It can't, you know, not a good thing, but, but it can be something that will, that will kill you, not will save you, but will kill you. And so, uh, we can fairly talk about having degrees of subjective confidence. You know, the, the Westminster Confession talks about assurance. You know, you can be you can be more and more, you can have more and more assurance as you walk along in your Christian walk. You know, a 70-year-old believer who has been through a thousand trials um, and has studied his word, the word every day, is going to have a very strong assurance. Whereas, you know, a baby Christian is, is going to be uh, doubting a lot. And so, but, you know, do, but Clark rejects this idea of there being different degrees of assent. Just like pregnancy, there's no such thing as being almost pregnant, or being half pregnant, or being 95% pregnant. You, you are either pregnant or you are not pregnant. And if you are pregnant, you're 100% pregnant. <laughs> Just like if you fall through the ice, you're 100% dead. Um, uh, either your will to accept is triggered, or it is not triggered. And Ascent is defined at the point of the will being triggered. 
And so um, it's good to have confidence. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. The more confidence that you have, the more comfort you will have, psychological comfort you will have. And nobody has 100% cosmic certainty. Everyone, even that 70-year-old, uh, you know, who has been a Christian his whole life, has some doubt. Has some doubt. Because, as we discussed before, believing, we're talking about knowledge. We're talking about having knowledge of God's Word. And because none of us is omniscient, none of us have all knowledge, some degree is a necessary corollary of being human. And so uh, this is, so this is the, te the teaching on assent, the subjective acceptance of a declarative statement as true. And so in the next section, we're going to, we're going to discuss some of the other issues that I've been waiting to discuss this whole time. All of this, all of what I've been saying so far has just been a foundation laid down so we can discuss these issues of consent and reliance. And we'll talk with you then.